and welcome to lecture 7 of the second module of this course on accelerator physics. In the last lecture we learned about uh, the accelerating using traveling wave accelerators and multi-cell cavities. So let's just quickly revise what we learned in the previous lecture. So the wave propagates in an empty wave guide with a phase velocity greater than the velocity of light. So it is not possible to accelerate charged particles with this wave because the particle velocity is always lower than the velocity of light and thus lower than the phase velocity of the propagating wave. So the synchronism between the particle and the wave will not be possible and this is a necessary condition for acceleration. So this does not happen. So in a empty hollow waveguide you cannot accelerate the charged particles. Now by loading the uniform waveguide periodically with obstacles it is possible to reduce the phase velocity of the electromagnetic wave. So we saw that by uh, introduction of space harmonics, the uh, phase velocity of the wave in the waveguide can be reduced. So we get what is known as a slow wave, which can be used for particle acceleration. The waves now propagate in limited frequency intervals and these intervals are known as pass bands. Okay, now if we close the disc loaded waveguide structure at both the ends with metallic walls, the structure becomes a periodic loaded cavity. And uh, for the longitudinally open traveling wave structure, all frequencies are allowed. So there the dispersion curve was continuous and uh, all cell to cell phase variations are allowed. But now when it is closed at both ends forming a cavity, only certain modes with discrete frequencies and discrete phase changes can exist in this multi-cell cavity. So the allowed modes are equally spaced in K and the number of modes are same as the number of cells. The cell to cell phase shift is given by n pi by n minus 1 where n is from 0 to n minus 1, n capital N is the number of cells now. The 0 and pi mode are more efficient for acceleration because they have a field in all the cells. The pi by 2 uh, offers better stability but it is not very efficient because the alternate cells are unexcited. There is no field in the longitudinal direction for acceleration. So to solve this problem, the side couple structures like CCDTL, they combine the efficiency of the pi mode structure and the stability of the pi by 2 structure. So here electromagnetically the structure is still a pi by 2 structure whereas the beam sees the pi mode structure. So the efficiency of the pi mode structure and the stability of the pi by 2 mode structure is combined in the side couple structures. So with this we have learned about different cavities. Now today we will learn about superconducting cavities. So why do we need to go superconducting? Why can't we operate at normal conducting temperatures? Because you know that superconduct, uh, superconducting, superconductivity happens at very low temperatures. So you have to go to cryogenic temperatures for superconductivity. So let's see what are the advantages of going superconducting. Now if you see the electrical power to beam power, the transfer of power, so starting from the mains, the main switch. So the mains gives power to the high voltage power supply which in turn powers the RF source which could be a klystron or uh, an, uh, any type of RF amplifier, a solid state amplifier or a tetrode, any amplifier. And then this, so this produces electromagnetic waves high power electromagnetic waves at the required frequency and using a waveguide, this electromagnetic waves are transferred into the cavity. And into the cavity, we have studied that the total power that goes into the cavity, part of it is dissipated in the cavity because the normal conducting in the normal conducting cavity, the field penetrates up to a distance equal to the skin depth. And uh, there is some RF resistance on the surface. So some power is dissipated on the structure. So part of the power is dissipated in the structure and part of the power goes to the beam. So if you, if you uh, calculate the efficiency of transfer of this power, the total power coming from the klystron to the beam, this efficiency comes out to be very small. So in fact, for a normal conducting accelerator, the largest power loss in this entire system is between the RF cavity and the 
green. So let's see what is, uh, let's get some real numbers. So the total power dissipated, the total power uh, is the sum of the dissipated power and the beam power. So the efficiency is defined as power that goes to the beam divided by the total power here. So for the LEHIPA RFQ, so the LEHIPA is a low energy high intensity proton accelerator, a 20, uh, 20 MeV accelerator which is uh, in uh, which is at BARC. So here there is a accelerating structure called RFQ, the radio frequency quadrupole, which we will study about in a future lecture. So this accelerates the beam from proton beam from 50 kV to 3 MeV and the design current is 30 milliampere. So if you calculate the efficiency of the structure, so from here you can calculate the beam power. Now beam power as you know is delta W into the beam current. So here delta W is 3 MeV minus 50 kV and the beam current is equal to 30 milliampere. So if you take this and multiply, so you get 88.5 kilowatts. So the beam power is 88.5 kilowatts and in order to power this RFQ, 500 kilowatts of power is required. So you can see that the total power here is 500 kilowatts and out of that just about 88.5 kilowatts goes to the beam. The remaining more than 400 kilowatts is dissipated in the structure. Okay, So this is, uh, this is a huge amount of power that is dissipated in the structure. So if you calculate the efficiency, it is less than 20%. Similarly for the drift tube LINAC uh, at LEIPA, which uh, accelerates a 30 milliampere proton beam from 3 to 20 MeV. If you calculate the efficiency again, so the beam power here is 510 kilowatts and the total power required is 1800 kilowatts. So again, if you calculate the efficiency, it is very small. So it is just uh, less than 30 percent. So efficiency of normal conducting cavities is very small because a large amount of power is dissipated on the cavity walls. Now this is dissipated in the form of heat and it has to be removed because this is a huge amount of power and uh, if it is not removed then it will uh, cause heating of the cavity and when the cavity heats up its dimensions change and you know that the frequency of any mode depends upon the dimensions of the cavity. So the dimensions will change and the resonant frequency of the cavity for that mode will change. So now the power coming from the waveguide is at a fixed frequency whereas the frequency, the resonant frequency of the cavity has changed. So the power will be reflected back. So you need to maintain the cavity temperature so that there are no change in the dimensions. So a lot of uh, energy goes in cooling the cavity. These cavities are cooled by uh, flowing uh, chilled water or cool water uh, through the surface of the cavity. So that is how superconducting cavities come into picture but uh, before we understand superconducting cavities let us uh, quickly get a brief overview about superconductivity as we know today. So the present uh, theoretical basis for understanding the phenomena of superconductivity is provided by BCS theory. So it is given by three scientists Bardeen, Cooper and Schiffer. So at According to the BCS theory, at normal temperatures, the interaction of conduction electrons with the crystal lattice vibration, it results in ohmic energy dissipation, thereby producing heat. And according to the BCS theory, in superconducting state, there is an attractive interaction between the conduction electrons through exchange of virtual phonons. And what are phonons? They are quantized crystal lattice vibrations. So this interaction leads to the formation of correlated electron pairs at temperatures below a critical temperature and below a critical magnetic field. So below a certain temperature and a certain magnetic field, the electrons form co -elect uh, correlated electron pairs and these are known as Cooper pairs. These uh, Cooper pairs occupy the lowest energy state which is separated from the lowest conduction electron state by a finite energy gap. So energy required to break up a Cooper pair and raise both electrons from the ground state to uh, it is twice the energy gap which is about 3 electron volts. 
So unless this much amount of energy is provided, the electrons bound in a Cooper pair cannot be put in into a different energy state. So these electrons are essentially locked into the paired state and they behave like a superfluid, thus producing the phenomena of superconductivity. So these Cooper pairs are responsible for the phenomena of superconductivity below the critical temperature and critical magnetic field. Now as the temperature decreases below the critical temperature, the fraction of electrons that condense into the Cooper pairs increases. So there are both the Cooper pairs as well as the normal conduction electrons. But the fraction of electrons that condense into Cooper pairs that increases. At the critical temperature, none of the electrons are paired. While at T is equal to 0, all the electrons are in the form of Cooper pairs. So between these two temperatures, uh, T is equal to 0 and T is equal to Tc, two fluids coexist, the superfluid of the Cooper pairs and the normal fluid of the conduction electrons. So superconductors exhibit zero DC resistance. So the DC resistance is zero. However, if you apply time varying fields or for AC applications, a superconductor is not a perfect conductor. So fields do penetrate inside the superconducting if they are time varying. So superconductor ex still experiences ohmic losses for time dependent fields because Cooper pairs that are responsible for superconducting behavior, they do not have infinite mobility and they are not able to respond instantly to the time varying fields. So the shielding is not perfect for time depending time dependent fields. The fields in the superconductor attenuate with distance from the surface and the char this characteristic attenuation length is called the London penetration length which is of the order of uh, 10 to the power of minus 8 meters in niobium. Niobium is generally used for making superconducting cavities. So then the unpaired normal electrons that are always present whenever the temperature is greater than 0, they are accelerated by the residual uh, electric fields and they dissipate energy through their interaction with the crystal lattice. So uh, we have already seen the RF surface resistance for a normal conducting cavity. So it is equal to 1 upon sigma delta where sigma is the conductivity and delta is the skin depth. Okay, If you calculate this for uh, materials that are normally used for uh, making normal conducting cavities like copper and uh, at uh, RF frequencies, so this comes out in the order of milli ohms. Now super con for superconducting uh, materials, the RF surface resistance is uh, it consists of two parts. One is the uh, R, what is known as the RBCS and the other is the residual resistance. So the residual resistance is determined by the impurities and imperfections in the surface. Whereas the BCS uh, resistance depends upon uh, the critical temperature, temperature and the frequency of operation. So for niobium, which is the material generally used for making uh, superconducting cavities, alpha is uh, 1.92, the critical temperature is 9.2. Uh, so uh, you can calculate the uh, the residual resist you can calculate the RF surface uh, resistance at different frequencies with temperature and this normally comes out of the order of nano. -ohm. So you see that the uh, RF surface resistance of normal conducting cavities is in the range of milli ohm whereas here it is in the range of nano. -ohm. So the RF surface resistance has reduced drastically 10 to the power of 6 times lower in a superconducting uh, material. Now power dissipated in the cavity is equal to half Rs, Rs is the RF surface resistance and integral of H square over the entire surface of the cavity. Now here since the RF surface resistance is very small in a superconducting cavity, the power dissipated in the superconducting cavity will be very very less as compared to in a normal conducting cavity. So 10 to the power of 6 times smaller. So power dissipated in the superconducting cavity is 10 to the power of minus 5 or 10 to the power of minus 6 times the power dissipated in a normal cavity. Okay, so now you can see that whatever power is going into the cavity, this power that is being dissipated in the cavity has reduced a lot. So 
uh, all the power so this this becomes uh, very minimal so all the power literally almost all the power goes to the beam now <clears throat> now also if you calculate the quality factor the quality factor is the ratio of um, at a at a frequency it is the ratio of the stored energy to the power dissipated in the cavity so this is power dissipated in the cavity so since power dissipated is very small for a superconducting cavity the quality factor of the superconducting cavity is 10 to the power of 5 to 10 to the power of 6 times the uh, quality factor of a normal conducting so you can see here the quality factor is also very high the shunt impedance is given by the axial voltage divided by the power dissipation now normal conducting in normal conducting cavities the uh, uh, cavities are optimized for um high shunt impedance so the, their geometry is optimized so that you get high shunt impedance in superconducting cavities since power dissipated is so small the shunt impedance is already very high so you need not optimize it for shunt impedance so now uh, one of the parameters that was that is optimized is the is the iris of the cavity or the beam aperture through which the beam passes now larger the beam aperture smaller is the shunt impedance now so in normal conducting cavities the uh, in order to maximize the shunt impedance this is kept very small the beam aperture is kept very small so uh, in superconducting cavities since the shunt impedance is already very high you can uh, you can increase the size of the beam aperture this is useful because then uh, you can reduce the beam loss if the aperture is uh, large in size the beam loss can be reduced so normal conducting in normal conducting cavities the dissipated rf power to be removed gives the performance limit so the if you choose your uh, accelerating field let's say it's a tn010 cavity so you decide your e0 now for for this voltage or for this electric field there is certain power dissipation now uh, how high this electric field you can choose for acceleration depends upon what is the power dissipation that can be easily removed uh, by cooling the cavity so that uh, dissipated rf power to be removed it gives the performance limit whereas in a superconducting cavity you can afford to uh, so this power is is not very high so you can afford to increase the accelerating voltage so your accelerating field or accelerating voltage is very high in a superconducting cavity so let's do a quick comparison of uh, normal conducting versus superconducting cavity so uh, let's compare two cavities of similar dimensions so a pill box cavity of length uh, 10 uh, 10 cm and radius 7.65 operating at the same frequency 1500 megahertz and let's say uh, we have the same accelerating voltage 1 million volts so the normal conducting cavities operates at normal temperature which is 300 kelvin whereas the superconducting cavity is operated at low temperatures 2 kelvin now the rf uh, surface resistance here is uh, in normal conducting is of the order of milli ohm whereas here we see that it is of the order of nano ohm as a result the power dissipated in the normal conducting cavity is very high and if you see for the same accelerating voltage the power dissipated here is very very small as compared to this this is 198 kilowatt the power dissipated here is less than a watt okay the quality factor also if you see is very high in a superconducting cavity so here the advantage is that the rf power losses are negligible now here whatever power you are feeding into the cavity almost all power will go to the beam in a superconducting cavity whereas in the normal conducting cavity lot of power is dissipated in the cavity so this is a big advantage you are able to utilize uh, uh, most of the rf power in the case of superconducting cavity also since uh, here the power dissipated is very high in a normal conducting cavity so if you cannot go to very high accelerating voltages because if you go to higher accelerating voltages this will increase even more and then it depends upon how high uh, accelerating voltage you can use depends upon how much power you can remove from the cavity 
then larger beam aperture can be used in the case of superconducting cavities because they need not be optimized for a higher shunt impedance okay so superconducting cavities are particularly useful for accelerating cw beams now what are cw beams these are continuous wave beams so let us understand the difference between different types of beams we have a dc beam we have a cw or a continuous wave beam and we have a pulsed beam a dc beam if this is a beam coming from the ion source or the beam that is accelerated in a dc accelerator so this if you see the beam current it is coming continuously with time okay so uh, if if you see the beam coming from the ion source or in a dc accelerator this is a dc beam now you know that dc beam cannot be accelerated in a rf accelerator in any accelerator where the fields are varying with time the dc beam cannot be accelerated you need to bunch the beam and you need to bunch it at the same frequency as that of the applied rf in order to accelerate it in a rf accelerator okay so uh, such a beam which is bunched to accelerate it through a rf linear this is known as a cw beam or a continuous wave beam so the beam has to be bunched before acceleration through rf accelerator and at the same frequency or harmonic of the accelerator frequency this type of beam is called cw beam these bunches so these bunches if you see they are separated by time equal to the time period of the applied rf so if you see the distance between the bunches okay so we have already seen the distance between the bunches in space is of the order of beta lambda in time it is of the order of one rf period so for example if this is the rf cycle if one bunch is here the next bunch will come at this time so this is time difference is capital t okay the next is a pulsed beam uh, so the applied rf here is now pulsed the rf itself that is coming from the klystron this is pulsed so the beam will be accelerated only when the rf is on so the uh, rf is pulsed so rf is on for some time and then it is off for some time so during the time when the rf or the electromagnetic wave is off there will be no beam so pulse width of the rf is between few microseconds to few milliseconds okay so uh, these bunches are known as macro bunches so you can see here uh, so if you see the beam current so this is the so here the, this is the rf period this is generally of the order of nanoseconds and now for this duration the rf is on and for the this duration the rf is off so when the rf uh, uh, there is no electromagnetic wave there is no acceleration and during this time only we will have the beam so such a beam is known as a pulsed beam so there are three types of beams a dc beam a cw beam and a pulsed beam so in an rf accelerator you can accelerate only cw beam or pulsed beam a dc beam is accelerated in a dc accelerator the total beam power is given as delta w into ib so delta w is the uh, energy gain ib is the beam current into duty cycle so duty uh, what is duty cycle the duty cycle is defined as the uh, ratio of time for which the rf is on to the total time of the rf so here the rf is on for this duration and then it is off for this duration so this is the total time period so the time for which the rf is on only during that time we have the beam the rest of the time there is no beam so since there is no beam at this time so the beam power uh, will be reduced by the total beam power will be reduced by this time here so the beam power is given as delta w into ib into the duty cycle for cw operation the trf of is zero so that means there is rf at all times so this is the main difference between uh, between the cw and the pulsed beam for the cw beam the rf is on at all times so there will be a beam at all times here for the pulsed operation for some time the rf is put off now what is the advantage here now if uh, the advantage here is that the power uh, the beam power as well as the power dissipated in the cavity reduces because 
because so the total power that you are feeding in is the power dissipated plus the beam power now if the to this power is coming only in certain intervals so the power will be dissipated this power will be dissipated in the cavity only during those intervals so the total power that is dissipated in the cavity is reduced now average power dissipated in the cavity is reduced so uh, so power dissipation in a cw linac is much more than in a pulse linac the power dissipated in the cavity has to be removed because otherwise it will heat up the cavity and change the dimensions of the cavity and the resonant frequency of the cavity so pulsed operation reduces the power dissipated in the cavity so for this reason most of the cavities are operated in pulsed mode so in fact uh, not many accelerators are operated in cw mode because for most applications a pulsed accelerator is okay only for very specific applications like uh, say for example the accelerator driven subcritical system uh, which we saw in the uh, first lecture on linear accelerators so there one of the requirements from the accelerator was that it should be a cw accelerator so that is one of the biggest challenges in building this type of accelerator so therefore for cw as well as high duty cycle accelerators it is uh, using high gradients it is possible to use uh, doing uh, it is possible to make these accelerators using superconducting technology because in superconducting technologies this power dissipated in the cavity is very less okay or almost negligible so you can use superconducting uh, cavities for these applications so even taking into account the conversion factor for heat removal at 2k so at 2k in order to remove 1 watt of power roughly 1 to 1.2 kilowatts of power is required okay so even if you take this uh, conversion factor into account the uh, uh, for cw and high duty cycle applications it is cheaper to use superconducting cavities so now let's again compare this uh, two cavities now let's see here the average power dissipated for cw application is 198 kilowatt in a normal conducting cavity and it is 0.4 watts in a superconducting cavity now if we operate this accelerator at 1% duty cycle so that means Uh, only for one percent of the time the RF is on, remaining time it is off. So here we see that the power dissipation has come down a lot. It is now only one point nine eight kilowatts. Here also the power dissipation is very small. So in this case, it is easier to remove the power dissipation even during normal conducting operation. So for pulsed applications, it may be okay to use normal conducting accelerators, but for CW applications we see that the power dissipated is huge and so it is better to go for C, uh, superconducting accelerators so we see that rf power losses are negligible for superconducting accelerators so it is good for cw operation in pulsed operation it offers the advantage of large aperture so if you are accelerating let's say the beam to high energy and the beam current is also high and it's operating in the pulsed mode but So if the beam current is high the beam size could be large and there could be losses so if you go to uh, for pulsed operation even though normal conducting operation is okay but there to improve the shunt impedance the uh, beam aperture is kept small so if you go to superconducting you can increase the beam aperture so you can reduce the beam loss so higher accelerating voltage can be reduced so you can reduce the size total size of the accelerator and large beam aperture can be used <clears throat> okay so now let's see the rf uh, surface resistance of superconducting niobium so we have seen the formula is this so this is the residual resistance which depends upon the material how uh, how good the uh, material is or uh, if there are no imperfections in the material so it depends upon this typical values of uh, the residual resistance for good quality niobium are of the order of let's say 10 nano ohm here now the bcs resistance part depends upon the frequency it varies as square of the frequency of uh, operation and inversely on the temperature so r B, um, so the r bcs is high for high frequency operation so you can see here from this uh, graph the uh, at 3 gigahertz it is 
quite high as compared to 100 megahertz here so if uh, now typical values of uh, residual resistance as i said is of the order of uh, 10 nano ohm now the bcs resistance should be less than the r uh, residual so for high frequency operation you get lower values of the bcs resistance at lower temperatures so typically at high frequencies you operate at uh, lower temperatures whereas for uh, high frequency uh, whereas for low frequency operation the uh, bcs uh, r bcs is already lower than the is already lower than the uh, r residual so you can operate it at higher temperatures so these are uh, normally operated at uh, lower frequencies these are no normally operated at 4k whereas uh, at higher frequencies the temperature of operation is 1.8 to 2k so at lower frequencies cavities can be operated at higher temperatures